I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Do you know, often uh, people would say to you, you know, if you've covered a trial like Graham Dwyer or, you know, if you've sort of been in court, maybe when Larry Murphy was there, you know, people think they're a monster. But actually what's really striking when you come face to face with these people is how ordinary they look and how you could pass them on a street any day of the week. You could sit beside them on the bus and you wouldn't have a clue. And this week, a guy was up in court and Cloda has gone down for us to uh, be there to observe and to come back and sort of give your feelings on it as well as the facts of this case. But um, Morris Fitzgerald, and he's a serial sex offender, scary guy, this yeah. and somebody who could have passed through the courts there almost unnoticed had had this case not been covered. So tell me a little bit about him and what you thought of him and then we'll go into the details of what he did and and what he's done previous. Yeah, so Morris Fitzgerald is a 29 year old former jockey. Mm. He formerly trained under um, Ted Walsh, father of Ruby. Um, he was up in court on Friday or on Thursday, sorry, um, charged with um, he had four, four, sorry, four different charges. So mm. he was up for false imprisonment, assault causing harm. And he had two charges of uh, possession of a weapon, which were entered in all possibly by the prosecution. Right. Um, this guy, you know, you, you're going into it and you're thinking ex-jockey, you know, what, how much damage or how afraid could you be of somebody like that? You know, you're yeah. expecting somebody small. And he was, you know, a small enough guy. He walks out, he's well-dressed, well-groomed. The hair has been freshly done. Um, not an unattractive man, yeah. I would say. Um, you are expecting these people to be absolute monsters, mm. hideous monsters from, you know, the, Your nightmares, that lurk in literally. dark alleyways. Yeah. yeah, but these offenders, they aren't, they're, they're everyday people and that's how mm. they do what they do. Um, and when he came into the court, so was there a confidence about him? Was he feeling, did you, did you get the sense? Because courts are open places where members of the public can walk in. Um, and if you're trying to hide anything you've done, it's not the place to be. You know, everything is going to come out. This was he had pleaded guilty to some of these offences or he, he, he had it was not prosecutor. He entered on a few of them, but he pleaded guilty. So in that case, we don't hear the exact details of what went on. But during sentence hearing, you hear a lot of, you know, what happened and a bit of background about the individual. So. Did he exude a confidence or an arrogance or anything like that? No, I mean, the first time I'd seen um, a, or that I remember seeing um, a, 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 pro a perpetrator in the dock was when I went to the um, Jerry Hutch trial. Mm. And he walked out with this kind of, not a swagger, but he looked at the audience, he looked around the room, he kind of, you know, had a, had a look at what was going on. But this guy kind of, it was kind of head down, didn't look at the court was very intent watching. We got to see some CT CCTV footage from the attack, um, was intent on watching that, was engaging a lot in keeping an eye on the judge and what was being said. But there was no sort of confidence or presence about mm. him, really. He didn't really of, look at anyone. See, of course, he's he's pleading guilty. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, when you do see people plead guilty, they, they can often, they don't want to project confidence. They want to yeah. project shame and remorse mm -hmm. because he's... And, because it's not been, it's not his first time through the courts, of no. course, is it? Um, like, we had him in the Sunday World in yeah. 2016 um, for a very similar kind of attack. So what, like, what was the, the, like, this is a very random attack, isn't it? It's not, like, a lot of the sex offenders, it's, you know, people that they know, or family, girlfriends or whatever. But this really is one of those random Mm. Pick a and stranger. Let's set the scene because yep. it was the twenty seventh of August, twenty twenty two, and what happens and and where does this occur? So it happened in a remote la laneway in Dublin city centre. It is yeah, like you said, the the middle of August. It's a Saturday. It's a hot hot day. Um, at the end of the summer here in Ireland, um, he gets on a train in Mallow and he intended to travel to Kilkenny. Now it's not known why he didn't get off in Kilkenny, whether he had traveled just, to, you know, bought the ticket because it's cheaper to get there or whether he had planned to stop there. But anyway, he arrived into Dublin at around one o'clock in the day. During that time, he begins visiting 
couple of different pubs. He has his ba- a gym bag with him. So in his bag, he's got a change of clothes, um, his passport, you know, he got some money and he has two condoms. So from that, the, you know, the judges said there was some intent to stay or, or whatever, but he had no accommodation booked. Um, he went to a couple of different pubs around the city at about half five. So after he'd had a couple of drinks, he went into deals on Liffey Street and he bought two duck, two rolls of duct tape and a claw hammer as well as a shopping bag to put them into. Um, after this, he took off again and he went to another bar. He was in and out of the bar, going in and out of the smoking area. I assume it was a front to the bar area as well. He got chatting to a woman there who he brought inside and bought a drink for her. Um, all very normal bar the duct tape so yeah. far all but, very normal yeah. guy maybe out on the pull um, yeah. you know apart from you know the seams there was some alcohol taken and he made a decision that he was going to go and, and maybe go down this this yeah. path and has he been on at this point now to, to contacting women on the internet or has that come at a later point it seems though it wasn't brought up in the sentence in hearing but from the arraignment from yeah. the notes I read from that it appeared that he had been in touch with different women uh, on the internet maybe trying to meet up with them whether that was through Tinder or Facebook it hasn't been specified so during this kind of drinking session he's chatting yeah. up women in the smoking section he's chatting up women at the bar and he's possibly online as well trying to find yeah, somebody trying to, to find meet somebody. him yeah yeah that, that seems to be his MO for the day um, after more drinking, he after he finished with that woman, he went to um, Euro Giant on Abbey Street, which is just at the Lewis stop there, if anyone knows it. And he went in and he bought another roll of duct tape. And when he's in there, he's, he gets chatting to the cashier and they ch- exchange details and they plan to meet up later in the evening. So I assume, you know, she said, I'll, I'll meet you when my shift ends. But during that time he was also on the Lewis and Gardy were able to track him via CCTV and via his um, credit card, his, his bank card and through receipts and stuff like that. He'd been on the Lewis and he was seen on CCTV taking a picture of an unknown woman, which then, of course, this image was found on his phone when, when Gardy sees that. Um, he met the woman from the shop in another bar. They had about three three drinks together. Um, he left the bag of his, you know, his, his weapons. Yeah. He left that in the pub and went and walked her to her bus it's at this point at around quarter to 11, 11 o'clock that he meets his victim. Mm. Um, so he's in Temple Bar at this point. Uh, he was captured. Without the bag. Without the bag, yeah. Right. He's captured on CCTV at the Norseman pub. And, you know, they're outside. They're seen chatting with one another. They're walking. They seem to be kind of messing. I think at one point he gives her um, a piggyback. Mm. They leave. They walk along the keys. At this point, she is seen and she sort of unsteady on her feet she was described as um in the cctv they tried to flag down a taxi but they had no success so at this point he they walk back to the pub where he left his bag and he picks it up which again like we said we has his weapons in it mm. they then head on up the road to meeting house lane which is where the incident happens um they How do we know that place where is that it's o- it's off it's not too far from jervis street so just off mary's abbey it's they sometimes have gigs and stuff oh, yeah, on, okay. on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So busy. Yeah. Busy area, yeah. Remote was is, is not something and, that and like she is that described way. as a very vulnerable woman. Like that that's Absolutely. I mean like this is somebody that 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 has uh, diagnosed I think with schizophrenia was that that yeah. was said. So she he's picked on this person mm-hmm. that's extremely vulnerable without going into great details of her. Yeah, it, it seems like she has, you know, chronic schizophrenia even um up to now, she remains in a mental health facility after what happened to her. But the two of them went into the laneway um, at around 11 o'clock. Um, they're then actually picked up on CCTV. So this is a CCTV that we've seen in court. Um, it was There was like some apartments that were backing out onto this laneway. And again, it was a hot summer's night. So their windows were open. Um, some of the residents heard the woman shouting, you know, leave me alone, get this off me. Um, and that's when the ring camera kind of picks it up. So... Because the ring camera, it only picks up motion when mm-hmm. motion is detected, so it's not continuous. So there was a couple of small clips, but this CCTV was played out to the court. And it's kind of very jarring because you're sitting there and you're watching him, you know, in the, in the very small corner of the screen. He's standing over her and you can kind of just see the movement. But, you, but the screams are you can hear are so intense. And the sound of him pulling the tape continuously is being heard so you can hear her hear him wrapping her up you know he, first of all he bound her mouth and then her wrists and her ankles Gardy said that when they got to the scene they couldn't even t- rip the tape off her mouth they had to 
get a knife to remove. They just couldn't take it off. Um, but yeah, we see in the CCTV that uh, the attack happening, he's, you know, pulling her underneath the car. We can hear guardy sirens in the background. And as he obviously starts to hear them as well, he was intoxicated. So he might not have picked it up on it straight away. He, we see him dragging her. He's trying to hide her underneath a car. Mm. And when the guardy car lights come into the, into the, the shot, that's when he drops her and he starts to run. But of course, he's in a cul-de-sac. Yeah. And he runs just, you know, straight to a dead end is what we see. Um, He has a bit of a jostle with the guardy, but they do eventually restrain him. Right. I mean, at it's, which point they realise they have in their custody a guy who's obviously attempting to do something very serious to a woman. He's bound her up. Um, there's been no sexual assault, no. obviously, in this no. case. I mean, the, the woman actually tells Gardy he didn't rape me, but it was torture. And obviously, yeah. like... It, like well, I mean, she presumably thought she was going to be. Exactly. I mean, yeah. um, because... And there's a good reason that, that, that she would have thought that, because... Like he does have a history of something remarkably similar um, in a court case in 2016. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But um, so, yeah, so the, the guards have arrested him and they realise that they have a sex offender. Yeah, so they take him to Bridewell Guard Station that night and he's deemed unfit for interview because obviously he's intoxicated. So, you know, they, they end up interviewing him the next morning and, and during this interview, he, ca he does admit that he had hit her. Uh, he said, I'm guilty out, which is obviously, mm. you know, quirk phrase. Mm. Um, he said, I did whatever. I'm guilty of dragging her across the floor. I obviously hit her. And when the guardy asked, you know, what would you like to say to the victim? He said, sorry for everything. Um, but he had, yeah, he had very similar um, incident that happened in Tralee in 2015. There was very similar MO in that he had duct tape. Um, he had, um, he tried this woman. He had basically... He'd met her outside a nightclub, again, a vulnerable young woman. She had said that she had lost her friends. Um, she had said in, in subsequent interviews that she had felt that he was genuinely concerned for her welfare. You know, she was obviously maybe her phone had died or whatever may have happened that she had been separated for her, from her friends. And he said to her, he approached her and he was talking to her and he said, you know, there's a party back in my house. Come back with me. You know, you can stay in the spare room. It's fine. And she kind of trusted him in this kind of moment of vulnerability and afterwards of course she had said that she'd felt like such an idiot for trusting him but at that moment maybe it was the only person that you know yeah. was mm -hmm. there and seemed to help her and of course you know you try not especially as a woman you, you know you, you can't you do try and be trusting but obviously there is that level of having your guard up around people but you know she did go back to his his, his apartment um in Tralee he was working on a stud farm at the time so he's living in the area um, she went into bed fully clothed or whatever um, and he went off to bed, pops back in beside her a couple of, you know, while later and says, oh, I can't sleep and, you know, tries it on with her and she says, no, no, he's not taking no for an answer and, you know, tries to remove her clothes. Mm. Um, at this point, she gets up, gets dressed and leaves and, you know, she thinks she's safe, that she's away from mm. him. But at this point, she's, she's only a few kilometres down the road and next of all, she hears footsteps behind her and she doesn't know it at the time, but it's him again. Um, he threatens her, tells her that he will kill her if she doesn't comply. Um, drags her into a ditch. And the duct tape is again yeah, a feature. He, is has, it, right? he has duct tape and he has a scissors with him as well this time. Yeah. So another weapon. Um, he seems to have this kind of thing. Like he did say to Gardy that he was into bondage. Um, and before, hours before that, that first attack, or that second attack, sorry, that had happened in, in Tralee in 2015, because of course there was one prior to that as well, he had Googled girl taped and gagged. Um, and he had obviously, had, he, you know, he had, a, had an obsession with this. And at this point is, is when he admitted he was into bondage, but he pulled her into a ditch. And this time, two passers-by, there were two men who were working in a local nightclub in Tralee, actually intervened and called the guards. So, you know, he was at a stage where he, you know, was, was, Perhaps he was on top of her. He was in the in the ditch with her. It's only when Gardy found him in hiding in the bushes that she realized this is the guy who had tried to attack her earlier in the night as well. Um. So you know he was he was taken into custody. Now at this time he was out on bail because two years prior he had again there was a woman who was on a night out and she was you know going to the bathroom in a car park um somewhere in Tipperary and. He just pulled her back, got on top of her. And at this point, he was charged with sexual assault. Um, he pleaded guilty and was given a four-year suspended sentence. But from this, he was put on the sex offenders register. Right. And obviously from this again, when the attack happened in Tralee, that four-year sentence was imposed. So he went back, he went into prison for the first time and was only released there in 
2021, you know, less than a year before the attack happened. But when Gardi arrested him the third time for this attack that he was recently sentenced for, they had found on his phone, they'd found that picture of the girl from the Lewis, but they'd also found what they describe as stock images. So obviously they're, they're um, differentiating this between images that were posed and were consensual or there was implied consent, there was no violence, as opposed to images that he may have taken of women under duress, but they were women that had been, again, bound and gagged. So, I mean, he's on the move, like he's mm. between, that's three cities we know of that he has attacked women. Um, he's been jailed, by the way, for anybody listening or watching this on YouTube he did actually get a custodial sentence on Thursday of eight and a half years, but with the 18 months at the end of it suspended, we'll talk about that in a, a minute about sentencing. But um, I mean, this guy and I had actually been alerted to this upcoming sentencing because there is a concern that he's not that well known and he should be. No. And he's somebody who is moving around. He's young. He's clearly, is drink involved each time? Yes. All three occasions. Um, while he's not totally organised, he's not totally disorganised. Mm. He has his duct tape, he has evidence on his phone that he's obviously attracted to some sort of a bondage thing. And um, Yeah, like it's quite rare, those sort of stranger attacks. It's like, very rare. Like, you know, very if you rare. think of people that are that predatory, yeah. mm. like it's not common. But, I mean, it is particularly scary when you get somebody like that that has shows a degree of planning and, you know, an ability to sort of move between places and carry it out. I mean, it's... it's. He's reminding me of... I'm going to call him your guy. I know he's not <laughs> yeah, your guy. Yeah, yeah. But um, Paul... Paul Moore. Paul Moore, because there was a f- picture of Paul Moore shouting into Niall's face yeah. at one point. And if he'd hair... It would have been one of those <laughs> model type <laughs> photographs with the, the hairbrush. Yeah. You could just see the ferocity of him coming at you yeah. in that picture. But he was a similar sort of a character that was supposed to be banned from drinking because he, he was, you know, he had his sexual desires seemed to come yeah, to like the he forefront seemed, with drink. Exactly. He was, and again, he was quite a, uh, you know, not to me, but he was quite a talkative and intelligent person, I think. But he had this absolute impulse control problem. Mm. Like he was mm. out of control. And no matter what sentences he got, how much he was being monitored, he just kept striking again and again. Um, and again, as I said, like a lot, most sexual assaults are between people that know each other. Yeah. Family members, you know, partners. So like these kind of real predators, like it's really, really uncommon. And it's very, very, uh, it's very hard to hear really stuff like it that. Is, a, yeah. a woman that is. It's very good to highlight, though, I think, it, as well. It is. And a woman that is sort of schizophrenic. Oh, yeah. Prey on that. Like, it's not. It's because, you know, the thing is, like our experience of these people, not that we're up close and personal as such, but just from our, our work. Yeah. Myself and I would often say there's sort of a lot of them are social misfits. There's something just a little bit uncomfortable about being in their company. A lot of people would say that. So that's why they tend to mm. find and seek out the vulnerable. I'm just thinking the forefront of my mind here is Graham Dwyer and the kind of victims he went for were very, very vulnerable women. Um, and clearly Larry Murphy, who has a conviction for horrific sexual assault mm. and who has been named as a suspect in uh, some of the cases of some of the missing women. Um although there doesn't appear to be any forensic or otherwise evidence, but he is certainly suspected on that. Again, an individual that if you go and you speak to people who've been in his company, they just say there's just something a little bit off, Mm. something a little bit odd about him. And um, Fitzgerald, that's not to say people are safe from Fitzgerald if he's like that. He's wandering around these pubs in town. He's obviously hunting for somebody until he eventually comes upon somebody who is. And he's he's. Like, obviously functioning enough to get somebody to go on a date with him after work, after their shift finishes. Yeah, I mean, it appears like he had had relationships beforehand from going through his social yeah. media today. Um, we could see that he, he appeared to have been, had a girlfriend and everything like that before. And obviously, we don't have testimony from people who know him mm. prior to these assaults. Um, you know, it has been said that he had fallen and had, you know, numerous concussions um, or head injuries, um, obviously from being a jockey. And... Was yeah. that given as kind of part of his character? No, this is from previous right, um, court from previous, dates. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, there's this link between head injuries and kind of violence mm. and how people's personalities can change so quickly. So obviously we don't know if he was always like this. And I suppose this is it again. As somebody, you know, when you're interested in these kind of things, you kind of want an answer. Well, why did they, why, why are these monsters the way they are? And I think that's a natural thing for everyone to want to know the why so that they can prevent it um, and stop it happening in the well, future. But I mean, yeah, definitely brain injuries can reduce impulse control. I mean, Absolutely. there's just no doubt about it. Like there's some there's a couple of famous cases of NFL players over in America who had who suffered brain injuries. Mm-hmm. Sometimes these things are said in court and they're unqualified. Yeah. Like nobody is presenting a, a brain scan to say yeah. this concussions causes this. It could be. Yeah. It's easy to say it in, in, in mitigation, is it? Without, because you, have to, you want to say something, it. don't you? Yes. Because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously if you're defending this guy you want him to get as small a sentence as, as possible I mean, yeah, mm. I, mean I, d- I did speak to somebody who did know him when he was younger and um, the kind of character he was was a troubled person from a very young age okay and we, we actually wrote about him in 2016 after his conviction for the tree, yeah. tree attack we spoke to Ted Walsh at the time who obviously knew nothing about it yeah that he was horrified to learn of it. Ted Walsh, obviously one of the most uh, famous uh, trainers in, in Ireland. Um, but at the time we we did that, I do remember we got a couple of emails, which we often do yeah. from people saying, oh, leave the poor guy alone. He oh, just right. had an, he just had a, you a know, bad night. Yeah, whatever. Right. Like as you, you always over. get this, yeah. like, mm. you, you know, often, I mean, we've had people commit the most terrible sex crimes and had their mother or sister ring up and say, mm. how dare you do this? So it's just it's just when you when you get that, you know, you realize that there are people and it wasn't his family or anything like that. But there are people around sometimes that want to downplay this, keep it out of the media, you know, and just to hear him. Well, I mean, there's always the, the kind of, you know. To blame it on the woman. Yeah. Isn't there? There is. The whole there is. thing there that, you know, women often will complain that they get sort of accused because they were drunk or because they weren't looking exactly. after themselves properly that, you know. Yeah, they feel like they go on trial. Exactly. I mean, but it's amazing. Like, this guy is only out a number of months, really, is it? Because the, the attack was 2020. Uh, two, 22 and he was just out in 2021 yeah, it appears like he was only yeah he was only out of prison less than a year when this happened i mean yeah even looking back you know in, during mitigation you know that that was one of the things his, de- his defense said that you know he had he was only a young lad yeah. which was one of the and he had spent most of his 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 20s in prison and um, which isn't an excuse for what he's done you know and even at that when you're saying women can feel like they're on trial for things like this because they were drunk or what was she wearing that sort of thing you know the mitigation again was well he was intoxicated so you mm-hmm. know um which is disgraceful to hear mm. and, and sad to hear as a woman sitting there as well and other people who have been victims of sexual assault and whatnot to hear that you know it, it's it, it's not an excuse for her but it is for him mm-hmm. um but the, yeah the judge nolan who was who was sentencing yesterday you know was very clear in in to saying that you know they couldn't jail him preventively, preventatively, um, just in case he committed another crime. But they, but they were. What did that mean? I, I, I was now. I'm only reading it because I wasn't there myself. But Judge Martin Nolan, curious comments and I mean, uh, Judge, a sentence that Judge Martin Nolan and his sentencing has become a huge point of public controversy. Has yeah. it just fairly or unfairly? Mm-hmm. It is it is it is a source of huge public controversy. I mean, you can see it all over social media. Yeah. Um, you know, I suppose what he's trying to say there is, you know, he can't jail him. He can only jail him for the crime that's in front of him, as opposed to saying this man, you know, may not may be a danger in the future when he gets out. He can't put him in prison for 20 years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on the basis that this is a dangerous person. He can only for what's in front of him for what's yeah. in front of him so I suppose that's what he's he's saying there I mean in this occasion it is a lengthy sentence um, you know some people would what's say what's the maximum well I mean false imprisonment is a serious charge and mm. I'm, I'm sure it can it can go further I don't know if there's a, a maximum or, or sentence for that but you, you, there, there could have been a further a further he had to take into account his his guilty plea yeah, mm, yeah. which you have to right yeah. that's part of it he imposed a 10 year sentence. Yeah. Sorry, not an eight and a half. Well, that it was, was one, a year and a half suspended. Uh, year and suspended. a half suspended. Yeah. So a 10 year sentence, a year and a half suspended. It is actually a, you know, that is quite a long sentence. Um, 
for a three time offender, is it long enough? Well, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Mm. I mean, it's complicated, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, what else did Judge Nolan say about him? Now he did, he did discuss about his, um, his unhealthy and his criminal obsessions. Yeah, he he did note obviously that, you know, while this was a random victim, he clearly had a plan, um, and he had a violent plan at that. He was pre- he said, you know, he's prepared to use force to apprehend and take a woman, um, which you know he seems to have. The victim never was able to give a proper statement to the guardie because she is still um, in a mental health facility since the incident. Um, but her father wrote and submitted a, a victim impact statement to the court, which wasn't read aloud, but obviously that was taken into consideration by the judge. Um, he said that his certain interests and obsessions were to put them at their mildest, unhealthy and criminal. Um, and taken, obviously, the previous convictions into mm. consideration, he said that he would hope that he couldn't, he wouldn't reoffend, but he couldn't say for certain. I and mean, the, I think it probably brings up like, mm. what do you do with people like this? What do you do with people like this? I mean, so yeah. like, there's there's You'd a couple. Wonder, was the bag ever described? Well, of course, there was no. Was it was it described at any point during the sentence hearing as a rape kit? Was it a rape kit? Is that what he went out with in the morning? A rape kit. He had spare clothes in the bag, and then he put duct tape in it no so he actually he didn't have any weapons with him when he in that gym bag so Mm. he went to Dublin with a change of clothes and some condoms which would suggest you know he was maybe going out in the pool after having drink it could suggest that he had in his mind that he was going to cover up because he could have changed his clothes if there was an attack and used a condom which wouldn't leave any DNA any DNA well you know or he could have thought that and then there's duct tape in that bag he's no hotel room booked no 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 hotel room booked it seems like after he had he had consumed alcohol you know it's it's four hours on from when he got to Dublin that that's when he decides he's going to go and buy his silver duct tape and his claw hammer and whether or not that was his plan all along or not we don't know um but he certainly you know he he did have this well half that plan. bag was packed when he left in the morning with no drink taken yeah okay that was a change of clothes but and condoms mm. there was something in his mind Absolutely. Um, so just I'm talking about, you know, how do you deal yeah. with these people? I mean, people? look, you yeah. can have to. I know your, your, your Paul Moore was ordered not to drink yeah. alcohol because that was seen as a factor that really, you know, made him lose, lose any impulse control lose that any he had. Control. Okay. And he was also not allowed to approach random women, which was something that he liked to do, Paul Moore, which was if there was a GA match on or whatever, people were drinking out in the streets at summer like to go up and just start making conversation so he was I don't know if that was actually a court order I can't remember or he was directed not to do that but I mean it does it does drink with Fitzgerald his way of meeting a woman or finding a victim or you know he is remembering the next day what happened he's not discussing a blackout or it's not no, as if he said was there evidence of how much he had to drink or how drunk he was um, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of how much he drank the only time that that was mentioned was when he went to the bar with the woman from Euro Giant they had three drinks together mm-hmm. um, other than that there was no kind of um, quanti- quantity of how much he had drank I, although I suppose we can take into consideration the fact that he was ruled unfit to give a statement the mm-hmm. night that he got yeah. to the guard station because he was intoxicated. Mm-hmm. Well, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things I thought was that he was ordered to be of good behaviour and for, but he's only for five years he supervised mm. post-release. Yeah. Which is a strange kind Very of strange, thing. Very strange, but he's on this, he remains on the sex offenders register, no doubt. But yes. I mean, you know, like, what right. is the sex offenders register? And how does it work? Well, what, well, what is it like? Because, I mean, we know what it is, but I mean, it's... it's well, you're it's, supposed it's, to sign on. Right. Yes. And and then you're supposed to give your address and you're supposed to say if you're moving. Now, yes. let's look at the case of Larry Murphy, yeah. who wasn't strictly on it because his offence happened before it was set up. But they did kind of put him on yeah. a sex offenders register. But the fact is that the sex offenders register is a it, it's a trust with yeah. an offender. Yeah. You're relying on the offender to tell you the truth. Yes. And by nature, offenders and particular sex offenders aren't going to be trustworthy, honest people. Yeah. And so the fe- the sex offenders register, obviously, if there's vetting or anything like that, it kicks in. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if they if a sex offender moves address 
he has to within seven days go mm. to the guards and tell them of, of his address and really that's the only activity he has to do um, now and now some obviously of them he can't you know what I mean there'd be yeah, if there'd they be wanted some to mix with kids or whatever if there was those the guard of vetting is obviously not going to be a sex offender is not going to be guard it, it is not what you see in the states no. where you have repeat offenders with ankle bracelets mm -hmm. which mm. you know being monitored in real time it's just not that and there are uh, facilities for members of the public to actually go online to see where sex offenders are living near them. Yeah, that has never been something that's here, uh, or in the UK or or in other countries. There is sort of vigilante groups have kind of emerged to out sex offenders. Some of them would be more concentrated on offenders who are trying to groom younger kids and that. But it's. A bit of a mess, the whole thing, isn't it? It is, and of course there are. There's legislation that's proposed that could that that could change some of this. There is technology that's being discussed to be introduced. I mean, you have to say that the type of people that are like Morris Fitzgerald are quite a rarity, and that maybe there should be a way of categorising and keeping a track of of that kind of really high level predatory behaviour. I mean, you know, they're they're. But we're not doing it and it no. is it is scary to have sort of a young presentable mm. articulate person that obviously has a degree of social skills in terms of mixing and you know he'll be out obviously it's what was it eight and a half years so he'll be out in he'll be out in six years and is he in custody behavior. but he's in custody now back to, well, to, to august 2020 yes 2022. No, 2022 2022 so it's another year off so he'll be out in five well, yeah, Nearly. something like that, maybe you know. Yeah. So, so in in or around that. So it is. It is. It's, so he'll be thirty four. Like obviously, in this occasion, he's not being convicted of. He's been convicted of, of false imprisonment, not a not a, a specific sex offence. Though obviously, the motive is there and clear. Mm. Um. So yeah, it, this is this is it. Like it's it's not. Um. It, it's 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 unsettling to hear people that wrong, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like even mm -hmm. when we talk about gangland criminals who maybe commit murder or whatever. Like, they have a reason within their own logic, maybe for, for revenge or something like that. But to hear somebody planning and execute attacks on a random person who suffers from schizophrenia, mm. like, it is quite... Mm. And, I mean, also, is he... You know, what do we not know about him? Yeah. I mean, we have three cases where he's been caught. You know, women, the fact of the matter is who sometimes make decisions when they've drink taken and they don't want to know about it again and they don't complain about it and they don't, you know, there could have been other women that have met with Morris Fitzgerald that just wanted to park that as something that they didn't want to end up in court about or whatever. I mean, you know, the, the Rape Crisis Centre will talk about the amount of non-reported yeah. sex assaults. Which would be the majority of them. Yeah, the majority of them, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, no, he's so tell me what what did you how is your court experience, Cloda? My court experience. Well, I've been to I've never sat in the in the criminal courts watching sentencing like that before. I've been to murder trials. I've been to the district Which court, court. was it? It was in the central criminal court. It was court it's five, like was court it? five. Yeah. So. Which is the most chaotic when you. Yeah. It <laughs> was. It was very chaotic. So the whole time there was just m people yeah. going in and yeah. out and in and out. And I was like, well, why is the judge not going giving out yeah. to these people? Yeah. It was so distracting. And obviously when I'd been in district court, things go so fast. Yeah. You know, people for driving offences or whatever it might be but in the criminal court watching people come in with their bags ready to go off to prison I was yeah. like are they going off to prison with those bags no. and then I actually seen somebody a partner hand the bag and off he went to prison for 24 months for some yeah. for some drug conviction um, but no it, it was very interesting with this one you know I was afraid I was like oh gosh how am I going to see what's going on with all these people coming in and out but that's just yeah. silence mm -hmm. watching yeah. what was happening yeah. in this case yeah. They, they lash through some of those mentioned do. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it can be so chaotic and it can be difficult to I was trying to tell Clodagh where to sit and what yeah. to do and telling her not to be afraid to ask people if she didn't know no. what was going on yeah. and all the rest of it yeah. because the courts are just quite chaotic and they half are. the time you're sitting there going what just happened yeah did I miss that did and I the amount yeah. of people turn up in tracksuits I always think is yeah. would, would you not just put on the L Tin of fruit well, for I the have day. to say, <laughs> when uh, March 2020 happened and the courts, obviously, like everything else, went a bit chaotic with COVID and everything, and, and they're back. I mean, there are still 
quite a few people who are before the courts at the moment going around with face masks up to here because yeah, they're yeah. the best invention ever. Yeah. Nobody can photograph no, them no, coming no, in no. or out. Yeah. And when they're inside the court where they cannot be photographed, they have the face masks <laughs> underneath here like a kind of a yeah, slingshot. Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. Because, <laughs> but um, yeah, look, they can be, they can be crazy. But uh, it was a really good, interesting case to send you down on and to um, hear your thoughts on it like as well. I mean, on a personal level. Mm. What was yeah, it? I mean, as on a personal level, I'm sitting there and it's, you know, he he had this, as Nicola has taught me very much about, is the, the prison glow, mm-hmm. you know, their, their tone, they're working yeah. out, they're fresh, the fresh hair, could all that jazz. And what was most interesting to me was the fact that I was like, this guy is the exact same age as me. So I'm going to go through life now. I, like, this is something I'm never going to forget, you know. Mm, yeah. um, and again, being kind of a woman watching this and taking this in and obviously having experienced watching women go on trial in the past for things that have happened to them. It was kind of, I was delighted to, be, to see that he got such a sentence. You know, I was nervous because it was originally court 22. It was moved down to Judge Nolan. And obviously he has been very controversial recently in some yeah. of the sentences. So yeah. I was kind of like mm. very interested to see what was going to happen because um, I did see him give a suspended sentence suspended sentences for, you know, very various violent crimes and stuff in, throughout the morning. Um, but no, it was, he, you know, this guy. You spend the rest of your life now and all your mates are going to think you're completely over the top, totally paranoid. For goodness <laughs> sake, that's that job that's done that to you. But you will, you'll be saying to them, make sure that you stay together. Don't be getting a taxi home on your own. Yeah. yeah. You know? But I, and it's also like what they always say, it's is it the banal face of evil? The face of evil yeah. is, is banal and mm-hmm. un, 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 unexciting. Like you don't. That's it. You could have sat on that train with yeah, him on yeah, the way up absolutely. from Cork. He's from Buttevant originally, isn't he? Yes. yes. Um, and you wouldn't have had a clue. You could have had just a normal yeah. chat with him. And yeah, you're probably eyeing some guy further down that looks a bit dodgy. But these are this is the banal. Face exactly. Of evil, the guy, you know. Exactly. So just given that we mentioned him, Graham Dwyer, um, he. Let me just tell you about Graham Dwyer. Because for the last few kind of like, how long has this gone on now? This has gone on and on, this appeal. But there's been this sort of um, sense from the public that is Graham Dwyer going to walk free? He's, you know, he's appealing. He's taking this this case that his uh, conviction shouldn't be upheld. And there was all sorts of complicated reasons around his phone, which I've actually done podcasts on. And I still don't quite try. Well, I sometimes... I I have an ability be- to sound much better. No, no, I've an ability to sound like I know what I'm talking about. He's even typical, if I don't. He's a typical journalist. Yeah. He knows a little bit about lots of that things, but not a lot about anything. No, yeah, a little bit, you know, you repeat in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> Ad nauseum. So, <laughs> so, well, it's basically to do with the retention of the data of his phone, which was a big part of it, Graham Dwyer's conviction, his phone contact with Elaine O'Hara's murder victim. Um, and it eventually went to the to the European courts who said the Gardaí aren't allowed just retain whatever data they want. Um, the, that went back to the Supreme Court who, who, who verified that decision effectively and they sent it back then to the, to the appeal courts. But the appeal court has judged that, that the conviction didn't solely rely on the mobile phone. There was a, a chain of circumstantial evidence effectively and that the conviction is safe to stand. That that was a feature of it, but it wasn't the, the sole determining factor. It's not dissimilar to um, the Mr. Moonlight case where... Patrick Quirk we were talking about last yes, week, exactly. Yes. Where there is, you know, as, as Eamon described it, all these threads that create a rope. Yes. And just two of them were sent on to the Supreme Court. One of them has come back. Yeah, so it's a, it 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 is a uh, an important decision in the in the in the higher courts about about the retention of data, but whether it, you know, these things aren't automatically retrospectively uh, applied to cases. The cases have been held in front of a jury. There's a, there's a load of evidence, and it doesn't automatically mean things are are thrown out. So I mean, I believe Graham Dwyer can now appeal again to the Supreme Court. That would. Is that correct? And he'll pro- I, I, look, I don't know. He's okay, can well, he go again well, to the Supreme Court? Well, I mean, well, it, it, look, the conviction, the, the the overall conviction for murder 
there hasn't been that he can go to the Supreme Court with that. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been any indication about that. So no. just for the moment, no, I, I mean, of course, it would he's take, lost this appeal. Yeah, and then he would have a period of time to, to appeal to, to the higher but court Because he again. doesn't bore you to death about data because he loves a bit of data. <laughs> no. No idea that well, I don't, because even as I'm describe, explaining that, I'm thinking, oh. But can you see myself and Claudia going like this as I no, see No, 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 I don't. Here. I know you're pretending to, um, which is fascinating. No, I'm actually sitting there thinking, God, I'm glad you I'm getting this wrong now. Yeah. No, the I'm going to get no, you're slaughtered, no, I did ask slaughtered on explain. Twitter. But um, what I was going to say was, on a more serious note, in the case of Graeme Dwyer and the murder of Elaine O'Hara. So Elaine O'Hara's body was a long time lying in the open before she was found. And actually, like her complete remains were never found. And what was sort of unique about the case against Graeme Dwyer was in bringing it, the state had no cause of death. They had no idea how she actually died. So that was going to be a problem for them. So they did have to bring in all this circumstantial evidence. And a lot of it was on phone. Some of it was on computers. But, you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of evidence that he was going on the Internet to look up the kind of things he wanted to do to women. And, you know, he was what they call interested in peakerism which was stabbing a woman while having that that's what aroused him basically um and he had been somebody who was increasing his sort of acting out his fantasies all the time and there was evidence that that was getting you know it was 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 building to something which the state said was the murder of elaine o'hara but just when you see morris fitzgerald Mm. also you know going online to to look, obviously, at what he then... Carried out to a degree, anyway. To a degree. Yeah. There's certain, like, similarities. There's sort of mm. some sort of a bondage situation with the duct tape and that. But, um, so, I mean, Niall, you're right. I mean, these are the kind of the guys that are at the highest level of probably of danger to women, to random women, to women who are walking down the street or people who are out for a drink in a bar because there can be a lot of hysteria around this. Yeah. You know, with women feeling very afraid, which women shouldn't feel very afraid. You know, you're yeah. not really going to be the likelihood of you being attacked by a random stranger hiding in a bush is really small. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you know, in this country, gun crime against individuals involved in organized criminal activities is far more likely to happen than you you're know, not somebody. Be, who's yeah, you're not likely to be stopped on the street and shot or attacked. And, and that's some reason why we're doing a podcast on, on Morris Fitzgerald and Graham Dwyer became so notorious is because these things are really quite rare. Mm-hmm. Um, but Graham Dwyer, again, ultra normal, like beyond yeah. normal, yeah. you know, yeah. like model airplanes, was an architect, a boring Square. house husband. I mean, kids, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's it just it, it that's partly, I think, some of the reason why it became so notorious because it's so unusual and mm-hmm. unheard of, you know. Um, yeah, so if these, these, there are a small number of men that are of that real predatory nature. Um, yeah, and it's up to you know, it's up to the I suppose the sentencing is one element of it. I do think the media has a role, they do, you know, in in. And the Sunday world can be slagged off for using pictures of people and all the rest of it. But in the end of the day, it's good for people to look at that face of Mara Fitzgerald, Mara Fitzgerald women, and to know what he looks like. I mean, it's not going to be embedded in your brain. I don't want people to be having nightmares about him. But it's good to keep sort of abreast of who these men are and just so as anybody could report them if they're acting suspiciously as well. I mean, we have five years. It's not that long. I mean, we have we had a case recently of uh, of a very notorious uh, killer and sex offender who reappeared on tinder after he got out with just a slightly different name yeah um, and that's quite common uh, yeah. you know this is where these people end up so there is a value for these people to be named shamed and pictured so thanks a million for covering that no uh, Cloda, and for your your um your great reportage of what happened in court um we'll maybe Traumatise me again Traumatise me again For the next week Yeah Yeah. So you can just end up Like really freaking out Your mates Yeah Yeah. Brilliant Um, Anything else Niall Are we No that's all good This week This week is the the No I mean There's there's, There have been I mean there have been Other developments I mean I think There was an interesting Development um, With the Criminal Assets Bureau And the Gardaí um, And the Spanish police uh, Targeting Barry Young's uh, 
crime gang in Spain. Very interesting development because that's exactly what needs to be happening. Yeah, um, and you know, so we'll have more in the in 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 the paper this weekend about that. So there have been further developments, but and you and I'll talk about that maybe next week, or myself and Eamon will talk yeah. about that further because that is a really big thing that Europe needs to. I would think they're having calls for it by people way sort of more important yeah. roles than yeah. I am. But I think there has to be a sort of a Europol of cab yeah. working together because these criminals, they are not just keeping their money in no. one country. They're transferring them. They're, they've assets all over the world. And the only w- real way you get to them next is is to go for them w- in cooperation with them, um, with other assets these recovery forces, yeah. agencies. OK, so thanks a million. Thanks, Oda.